Hey everybody, welcome to our lunchtime keynote. I hope the morning went well so far. I hope you had a chance to get up from your computer, maybe get something to eat as you settle back in uh, for our keynote for the lunchtime hour. Um, we still have a whole half a day of um, exciting learning to happen, so hopefully um, you'll take advantage of that. Uh, as we're going, if you, if you refer back to the schedule, you'll see we've already started to put some of the recordings up, so you'll see that those will slowly fill in in the schedule. The Zoom links will disappear and the recording links will show up as we get the videos uploaded to YouTube. So those will start to um, change as the day goes on and then into tomorrow. But let's talk about our keynote. So we have our uh, keynote event for now, which is exciting. We have Rob Carr with us. There's Rob over there. Um, if you haven't heard us chatting beforehand, I like the idea of him standing in his house. That's cool. I like that. Uh, Rob is the ICT Accessibility Program Manager at Oklahoma Able Tech. And Rob and I agreed that we would not do the stuffy bio introduction. The bio is on the website. If you're interested, please go there. Um, I'll, I'll tell you that Rob's a great guy and I'm excited. First, that he agreed, which is great. Uh, second, that he's got such a wealth of information that I know you're going to get a ton out of this. Um, Rob and I are, uh, collaborate on the ATIA conference. We are strand advisors together uh, for the mainstream and web accessibility strand, I think is what it's called. I think so. Something like that. Yeah, we collaborate on that. And then we see each other at all of the um, state AT Act uh, events. So I'm very excited he's here and I don't want to take up any more of his time. Rob, thank you for being here and take it away. Mike, thank you and, and thanks to everybody for having me. <clears throat> Let me take some time during your lunch break. Um, I'm standing, uh, you know, you're wherever you are. Feel free to stand as well. It's a lot to sit and have Zoom in your face for hour after hour, but it's also a lot of really good content. I've been able to jump in a couple of the sessions and uh, have seen Hey, Rob, your mic turned off. Rob. Hey, Rob, we lost your sound. Lost your sound, Rob. <laughs> oh no, I can't get him. Can't hear you. Yeah. No, we lost the sound. No sound. Nope, nothing yet. Everyone, it's all going to be fine. Don't worry about it. Here we go. Let's figure it out. Oh, we had, no, we had you for a second. It came back for a second and then it turned right back off. Okay, let's try that. Is that any better? Yes, that's better. That's it. Okay. Awesome. Thank goodness for multiple mics. Love it. <laughs> Thank you. 
Okay, now our captioning is not agreeing. Okay, let's see if everything is actually working. Yes, everything's Audio, working. can you hear? Yes. Yes, I can hear. Okay, excellent. So the point I was about to make is just that we're surrounded by the web and technology more now than we were on the 1st of March. Um, and we're, we've always been surrounded by it. It's always been outrageously important. It's just more so. So I want to set the stage by talking a little bit about technology in these different phases of our lives. Uh, employment. Employers, job seekers have connected online now more than ever before. And I think this carries on through the other examples I'm going to give, that general idea about connecting remotely. But when you think about employment, the first thing that comes to mind is often what happens on the job. But when we think about where technology reaches in the context of employment, it starts at recruiting. You know, I mean, platforms like LinkedIn, platforms that are specific to uh, hiring that companies might run themselves, even an organization's website is usually a recruiting tool for employees. And at the very least, the organization's website is a place to go to try to find things out about the employer. So we start before we've even talked to a job seeker, before we really even know that they're interested in our organization, they're on our websites, they're finding information out about us through these different technology platforms. I think a lot of employers very, very quickly learn how to accept job applications digitally when everything first shut down back in March. A lot were already accepting things virtually, but like many other people in many other phases that we'll talk about, really, really quickly, people learned, oh, we need a way for people to apply without coming here. People aren't comfortable getting out and they're not going to come in. And if they were an employer who was actually hiring, then they needed to get that recruitment information, the application information, and even things like interviews and onboarding and benefits enrollment for those who are benefits eligible. All of these things, if they weren't before, became digital almost overnight. That's before anybody even sits down at the work and starts working, right? That's before somebody sits down and has whatever productivity software or tools that they use. That's before there are opportunities announced internally for advancement. That's before someone gets a note about a retirement party. There's just so many phases of employment that now are digital and that we rely on and that we just expect to be digital. You know, Zoom was something that I feel like a few of us were familiar with back in March. Now, this event is on Zoom. We have meetings, trainings on Zoom or on Microsoft Teams or on other collaboration platforms. And a lot of employers are seriously considering not bringing everybody back, right? We've realized that people get a lot done working remotely and that not everyone has to be in the office at the same time during regular hours. There is more flexibility out there than what we've seen before. For a lot of people with disabilities, it's a frustration because a lot of people with disabilities have had an accommodations request to work remotely turned down because employers said, oh no, we can't do that. And then of course, when the entire workforce had to be remote, they figured it out. Nonetheless, it's that growth of technology, that web around us. It's also true in educational spaces. This is a, a little illustrated drawing that I won't leave up too long. It's not moving a bunch, but it is still moving. But it shows a computer on a desktop with a little lamp and there's an instructor who is gesturing toward a chalkboard that has three times three equals nine. Again, in the course of, of a matter of weeks, our entire educational system went online. Here in Oklahoma, we work a lot with a lot of our higher education institutions, and many of them did blended, so a combination of online and in-person instruction before. Many did purely distance education, but there are still a lot of instructors in higher education that had to make this pivot really, really quickly. At least here in Oklahoma, we don't have a lot of blended learning in our primary and secondary education. So those teachers really, really quickly in the span of a couple of weeks shifted everything to online. 
So again, it's not that this was new. It's just that it was new for a lot of us. Anybody who has kids who are school age uh, knows what it's like to all of a sudden have the education coming in virtually and having to run tech support at a minimum. And in some cases, having to try to help with instruction and having to just deal with the logistics of having folks, uh, of having people at home all the time. And this is something that spans the education and the employment piece. I've actually worked remotely since 2013. Uh, and everyone says, oh, well, so you were good when everything shut down. But it changed my workplace significantly because all of a sudden my wife was working remotely. Our boys were in school remotely. They were doing soccer through Zoom. The coaches would set up, have them set up cones in the yard that were in range of the camera and they would run drills or they would talk strategy. We have 15 Zoom meetings a day, literally. So the logistics changed for everybody. And again, it's because that web of technology just became that much bigger. Another phase of life is our civic life. So there's a, an illustration here of a button with vote on it. Uh, in Oklahoma, we don't have online voting. Um, online voting has not caught on in the US, but you can do everything up to that point online. So you can check your registration, you can find your polling place, you can figure out how to register to vote, much less things like paying a water bill, which you can do, of course, through the mail. But a lot of cities, a lot of municipalities, a lot of states, again, in a couple of weeks, pushed everything to the web. They took interactions that were previously in person, permitting, things like that, and they moved it all to the web really, really quickly. So again, that web just got bigger and surrounded us more. Our social lives, this is a, an illustration of something like a Zoom. And we've got six folks on here, a couple of them have headsets. One person has their cat in their lap. I've closed the door, so maybe the cat won't join us. One person's got their water bottle. Miraculously, it looks like only one person is talking, which now that all of us have been in Zoom meetings, we know that that doesn't happen very often. But our social interactions have gone virtual. And in some cases, it's an opportunity. And I think that that's one of the things that has been strange about this, is we have started to see a silver lining. We've been able to connect with people because we realize it doesn't matter if they're in our town or if they're halfway across the world. As long as we can work out the timing, we can use these platforms, these technology platforms, to drive that engagement, to, to stay in touch with people. It's undoubtedly strange. And it's very different to do virtual yoga than in-person yoga, but it's still the way that we have carried out a lot of our social interactions while the places where we normally interact are shut down or are really limiting the capacity that they have. So think about shopping. I don't know what it's like in New Jersey. Oklahoma has been a little laissez-faire, a little hands-off in terms of a statewide approach or shut down or mandates, but we, we've been careful in our house. And from that first week in March, which was right before our spring break here for our schools, we pretty well shut everything down. And over time, it's been kind of amazing to see the big box retailers and local retailers arrange for curbside pickup for a hands-free, no contact transaction where you purchase the thing online through, as this shows, this illustration has a, a phone, smartphone, where someone's making a purchase of a piece of clothing. Or you can do that from your tablet, your desktop, your laptop, doesn't matter. You can make these transactions or start these transactions now through an app or through the website, and you can go pick the thing up and never have to go in the store. It's just incredible. And again, it means that this technology is even more important, which means that accessibility is amplified as well. The last example I'll give really briefly is entertainment. Uh, I, I'm a fan of a band in Pittsburgh that had an album release scheduled for the spring. I think it was March or early April. And they went ahead and released it. A lot of musicians have held off. But not only did they release it, they kept their, uh, their released concert. They just streamed it to an empty arena, but they streamed it out through the web. I think they used Twitch. I think a lot of musicians have used Twitch to try to monetize uh, that experience as well, to bring a little revenue in at a time when our live venues are closed. So even in our entertainment, 
we've gone virtual. And we have platforms in front of us that we didn't know existed in March. And one big important part of this, this is a picture of somebody talking into a tin can phone, right? You take two tin cans, you run string between them, and you can talk and hear through the cans. The communication that has happened and that has been just a part of our lives since this began from initial outbreaks and shutdowns and mandates and logistics about all of these different things that I've just talked about with employment and education and so on. The communication that has come at us digitally that might have before come home in a kid's backpack, it's coming in email and those emails have links to PDFs or they have links to different platforms that the, the schools or employers and whoever it is use. Our social media posts are really, really important for a lot of our local businesses. That's how they're letting us know, are they still doing delivery? Are they still doing curbside? Uh, what is the capacity of the place in this pandemic? And this communication is so, so important. Some of it might not hit the level of emergency communication, but it's a pretty big deal to know what the situation is like in your office or in your place of work, for example. It's really important to know what the schools are going to do. We need that information communicated to us. And communication is an umbrella that we could really put over this entire conversation, this entire dialogue about the way that the internet does or doesn't work for people is critically important. And again, it's because the communication is coming at us through these remote channels. And there's a really good point that I do want to mention, uh, Beth made in the chat, brought attention to internet gaps and device gaps. Um, we saw that in our own school district. Our district at the end of last year basically called off actual instruction and they went into kind of a maintenance program because they know that a lot of kids don't have good enough internet or don't have enough devices. So we talk about the digital divide. Um, and that's something that, yes, this has indeed exposed even more a different kind of accessibility, but a big barrier. So let's switch gears a little bit and take that, that stage that we've set, the foundation where we, we, we're well aware of how wide the net is with uh, technology. Now, let's start to talk about accessible technology. And I'm going to begin with a definition that's actually been used in a lot of settlement agreements that have been reached between uh, higher education institutions or public schools or agencies and folks who have alleged digital discrimination. And I, I think it's, it's an insightful and helpful definition. Accessible means that individuals with disabilities are able to independently acquire the same information, engage in the same interactions, and enjoy the same services within the same time frame as individuals without disabilities with substantially equivalent ease of use. It's a really long sentence, but I wanna point out just a few things. One, independence. When we talk about civil rights, human rights, a lot of the focus is on independence. In other words, if you have a student who's blind in your class, don't ask them to have one of their classmates lead something off of a computer screen. You know, people need to be able to independently engage in these activities and consume this information, whether they have a disability or not. The other thing that I think is insightful about this is the word same is used four times. Same information, same interactions, same services, and same time frame. So this leaves room for respecting the fact that someone might have a different interaction with their device. They might use assistive technology to interact with their phone or tablet or computer. What this talks about is when we talk about same interactions is they need to be able to access the same website, the same PDF. You know, the same information needs to be available. And one of the ways that that actually happens, that that isn't broken, is by having the same interactions. Same services, same time frame. So this speaks to a time frame in particular it's not enough to say, if you have a disability and need help, call us between eight and five. That's not really how the web works. Most of this digital material is out there 24 seven. So I like this to put things into context. I'm not gonna go into a big policy talk right now, 
Um, but I do think that this is a really insightful and helpful way to frame the conversation about accessibility on the web and in technology. So what does accessibility mean? What does accessibility look and act like? So there are, uh, there is a group, there's an international standards group that basically writes building code for the web. And they have a web accessibility initiative that, as that name suggests, focuses on accessibility specifically. And their work is based on four general principles. In order for something to be accessible on the web or in a PDF or what have you, it needs to be perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. That acronym that that spells out, POR, is really widely used in the accessibility community. Some of you all may well have heard that before. And I'll go through what each one of these suggests and what some of the implications are in each one of these different fundamental ideas. First, perceivable. Digital information has to get into our brain, right? And it doesn't matter if you can see the screen or not, if you can hear or not. The first step is making sure that information gets into our brain. There are visual pieces of this. I think a lot of people, especially in the tech space, think about accessibility as something that you really do for people who use screen readers and are blind. And of course, accessibility and the standards and the work aims at removing barriers for screen reader users, but there are visual components to it. So you think about a chart or a graph that uses color to distinguish between different data sets. If it doesn't use something else in addition to color, it's not accessible because if someone can't perceive the difference in color, then they can't perceive the information. And this also comes down to the way the web is built. We're not gonna get technology deep today in this session. We'll talk a little bit about structure in the session I'm doing about an hour after we're done with the keynote. But it's really important that the web is built right. That's why there are standards. That's why there is basically a building code for the web specific to making it so that it's accessible. There's a lot that has to happen behind the screen for people to be able to perceive information. We think about operable. There's a phrase that you see in policy, input device independence. And what this means is that somebody can't be limited to using a keyboard and a mouse, for example. The web shouldn't care if someone uses a mouse or not, or strictly uses a keyboard, or uses like the image on the screen is of uh, some adaptive switches. Now you can set adaptive switches up, many of you know this, uh, through the operating system on a device and so that they send signals to the device and to a web browser, which means that the website that you get to through the browser needs to be ready for that interaction. Same with braille displays and the phrase is input device independence, but when you talk about speech to text like Dragon, you're still sending commands to your device that are being passed over into a browser and to the web page. So the idea is that the web needs to be flexible enough to work with these different device interactions that people have. Understandable has two basic ideas. Number one, we've gotta be able to actually understand the content of the web. Whether that's making sure that someone who is blind and uses a screen reader can get the information from a visual image or graph or what have you, or just making sure that the typed content is understandable. It's not confusing, that it doesn't use too many multi-syllable words, right? That the content is written to be uh, concise and in a plain language. The second piece when we think about understandable is people need to be able to actually understand interaction. So you think about software and everyone has used software that is just really hard to use. It may or may not be accessible, it's really hard to use. The layout is weird, it steps you through things in a way that doesn't make sense, or maybe there's an overlap between understanding the content and the interactions because the instructions that are there aren't clear. There's still a structural component to this as well. Uh, I think about date fields, right? If you type in a date, normally the system needs you to type it in a particular format. It could be month, month, day, day, year, 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 year. There could be two numbers in the year. If it's a site from overseas, it might flip those around, put the year first. 
And that information needs to be plainly available because that's going to make somebody hit an error, right? If they don't know the format of the date, then they're probably not going to put it in right. And you want to keep people from hitting errors when you have software. So making sure that that is understandable on screen and then structurally making sure that that note about the format is available again so a screen reader will announce it or a braille display will pop it up is a critical piece as well. And again, it's that structure back behind the screen. Then the R, the robust piece. Basically what we're aiming for is if a PDF or a web page is accessible today, it should still be accessible tomorrow. There, there is not just one set of standards about accessibility. There are actually standards for what web pages and software need to do. There are also standards for what a screen reader needs to do to interpret that. There are standards for what web browsers need to do to make sure that the screen reader and other assistive technologies can get all the information that's delivered. So we have this family of standards that helps really with all of these concepts. But to me, the fact that these standards all have the same goals is what makes it possible for something that we build now to still be accessible when a totally new device shows up in five or six years, if everyone is converging on those standards. So I've kind of alluded to this, but I wanna just specify what technology we're talking about when we talk about accessible technology. And really, I think we, we covered this when we talked about the different phases of life. But to reiterate and make the point more clear, hopefully, we're not just talking about web or websites. When people talk about web accessibility, they usually mean more than that. They might not know it, but they usually mean technology accessibility. And in policy and in the accessibility community, we do make it a little more general. We talk about technology accessibility because it's about software that you use. And a lot of websites actually have software that you wouldn't call software. It's not like Google Suite, which looks a lot like an installed piece of software. There is a lot of software that we use regularly that's delivered through the web. I alluded to this, mentioned this before, our social media, the posts, the platforms, the content that we put into social media platforms needs to be accessible. And remember I talked about how I know at least here, a lot of our Local businesses and organizations have used social media a lot. The, the city that we live in, in Norman, Oklahoma here, the city itself streamed things out through Facebook Live. They had a COVID update from the mayor every week for a while through Facebook Live. It's our mobile apps that we install on our devices. It's the PDF and Office. So you think about Word, like I'll discuss later on today, or PowerPoint that you use in trainings. It's email. So it's not only the email message itself, it's the attachments, which are usually those PDF or uh, office files. It's email platforms like Constant Contact and making sure again that we build those messages so that they are accessible. And it's also our multimedia. It's our streams like this. It's our recorded uh, audio or video. So when we talk about accessibility, it's pretty big, right? It's a lot of different technology. And I think that when organizations look at it and realize, well, this really touches every piece of technology that we use, it's easy for them to shut down. It looks like it's too big to take on. And we'll talk a little bit about some ways to, to make that easier to, to take on and, and some ways to break it down, not in full. Uh, but we will touch on that a little bit because if the technology is not accessible, it's a brick wall. I think everybody is familiar with physical barriers to access. You know, maybe it's a sidewalk where tree roots have pushed the sidewalk surface around and you've got an inch or two gap that a wheelchair will not safely clear going up or down. Um, and some may not at all. I know in older neighborhoods that happens a lot. If the sidewalk is 50 years old, the trees are probably beginning to demolish it. We've seen a lack of curb cuts. We, we've seen a lot of physical access barriers that act like a brick wall. The same thing happens in digital. And unfortunately, from our experience and from colleagues who have scanned websites across the world, we know that these brick walls exist a lot in the digital space. So what in the world can we actually do? 
as individuals, and when you're coming at this from an assistive technology background, which I think many, if not most of you are, you can educate and advocate about accessible technology. I'll, I'll give you some advice. Normally I ask, can I give you some advice? I'm gonna go ahead and put this out there. With the education piece, start with yourself. We have worked with a lot of people around Oklahoma and nationally, and we'll go into a conversation that someone else has started about accessibility. And maybe someone who uses a screen reader and is blind has gone over a web page and they say, oh, it's fine, it's accessible. But the screen reader, because of the way the web page was built, literally couldn't reach a part of the page. If that person can't see the screen, then they don't know that it was skipped. So when we come in and say, actually, it's not accessible, it's kind of a long conversation because as is very much true, the person using the screen reader, frankly, knows more about screen reader use than I do most of the time. We use screen readers as accessibility testing tools. So we know enough to operate in that context, but we don't pretend that we know the AT well enough to really speak from a first person perspective. This happens all the time. This happens with folks that are new to accessibility and just don't really know yet which way to go on some decisions about whether something is a barrier or is not. So educate yourselves. Hopefully this is a first step. Hopefully some of you will join me for the session on Word in a little bit to get a few more details. But educate and advocate for accessibility, even if you're not comfortable with the technology side of accessible technology you can still advocate for it. You can ask questions, you know. You can be in a meeting with people that influence decisions and just say, how are you all accounting for accessibility with this thing? So there are ways that individuals can contribute to this. And I know that the technology accessibility field still doesn't have enough people. There aren't enough of us that have the opportunity to work on accessibility either full-time or a lot. From the organizational side, so now I'm speaking to those of you who are part of an organization thinking about accessibility and also thinking about some messaging that those of you who want to advocate might be able to carry forward. Generally speaking, we want accessibility to be integrated into the technology environment. And that goes to planning and strategy for marketing as well as technology that goes into a lot of organizations and it goes into them pretty deeply. That's because there's just so much technology out there, right? So one of the first messaging points is that accessibility is a really valuable skill set. A lot of organizations treat it as a nice to have thing. So that's one of the first shifts that we try to get organizations and sometimes individual technology professionals to make as well. It's a valuable part of your skill set. It's not something that's just nice to have. Now, like any skill set, you do have to build it up. With everything remote, I will say that there are accessibility conferences and events out there that are all over the country, all over the world, and they have gone remote as well. So the opportunity for someone who doesn't have a travel budget to participate in the accessibility community and to begin to build that skill set I would say now it's, it's a better opportunity than ever before. Second point, accessibility is a marker of quality, not a bottleneck. The way that we see a lot of people in their individual workflow and organizations uh, take accessibility on is they basically stay it to the end. And that's like trying to put an elevator in a building that is three quarters built. You know, it, just, it, it, it makes people mad because there are delays, it's harder if you don't do it from the very beginning. So we talk all the time about accessibility as a marker of quality in our digital stuff, whatever that stuff might be. And that helps people to not think about it as, oh gosh, we have to do this thing that's gonna slow us down. Because talking about quality does tend to lead a conversation to where you, you talk more about what happens before something's ready to go. And what we hope that does is keep people from calling us two weeks before a website is ready to go out and say, hey, can you do some testing for us? Because normally by then, it's too late for anything significant to happen. The big picture with this 
is that organizations need to look at accessibility more as a sustainable program than as a standalone project. So there's a parallel in the, in the technology space where a lot of companies have privacy and security programs. And they have that because nobody wants to be the next one that's hacked, right? And that's something that organizations invest in and they view the skills as valuable. They see it as an indicator of quality. And so we, we need to look at accessibility more that way and make sure that all of us that contribute to the web have the support to build the skills that are relevant for us to help make our little slice of the technology space more accessible and have fewer barriers. A few closing thoughts. Organizations are responsible for accessibility and that doesn't matter or it doesn't matter if the organization creates something in-house. In other words, if you design a flyer that you send out to a whole bunch of people, yes, you own all of that. You need to make sure that it is accessible as an organization. But organizations also have to think about the platforms that they purchase or use or the contractors that they hire. Because ultimately, it's the organization's responsibility to account for accessibility at every step of the way. And we see that in our civil rights laws, more in the, the broader civil rights laws, the way they're being interpreted, sometimes in courts, sometimes in settlement agreements. But this is certainly a recurring theme. Accommodations are not accessibility. Now, I don't want you to think of this as a competitive thing. We're not pitting accommodations against accessibility, because really we need both. I think we need to really clearly understand, though, that Accommodations are granted for students, for employees, for program participants on an individual basis, and they are unique to that individual's needs. Accessibility is a broader thing. Accessibility is making sure proactively that we don't have barriers up that would keep people from interacting. You don't want to give an employer, an employee or a student an accommodation and then have them immediately hit a brick wall with the software that the accommodation should work with. One of the things that we counsel people not to do all the time is to say with a PDF that's not accessible, uh, just say, well, we'll make it accessible as an accommodation and instead move toward making sure that it's accessible from the very, very beginning. So, like I said, this isn't a competition. They're not going head to head against each other. They do need to work together. And the reason that I make this point is because we see people talk pretty frequently about making a PDF accessible as a form of accessibility, when really in that case, that's an accommodation. And we need to be a little more comfortable and clear about that difference. The last thought that I want to leave you all with uh, is that accessibility and technology is a civil right. It's a, it's a human rights issue. And I think that that is what amplifies the need for accessible technology at a time like now. In the middle of a pandemic, uh, accessibility in technology, when technology is so much more widely used, when it's so much more critical for each and every one of us, accessibility has to be amplified right along with that increased importance. And this is something, again, we can point to in the Americans with Disabilities Act. We can look at the Federal Rehabilitation Act. If you're with an organization that receives federal funding, this is a civil rights issue. It's part of the reason that I think there's a tie in the shirt I'm wearing. If you can't see the screen, it's one of the uh, quotes, better known quotes from Dr. Martin Luther King. <clears throat> Pardon me. And it says that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Um, at a time like this, when we think about discrimination, when we think about um, technology, there is an overlap between this conversation about accessible technology and the, some of the conversations we're having about diversity, equity, and inclusion. Because people with disabilities can't be included in the web unless the web is accessible. It's the first step. So another piece that can be helpful in messaging about it, another piece that might resonate with folks when you start to talk about accessibility to them. Just look, this is a civil rights issue. Um, this is a group of people that are traditionally marginalized that still face a lot of forms of discrimination. 
And we can, we can start to bring some of those barriers down with the technology that we influence or directly control and create. If you want to dig into this a little bit more, then you can check out, and I'll give you some Google search terms. I will also put these links into the chat real quick. But I'll start just by talking through them real quickly. The World Wide Web Consortium Web Accessibility Initiative has a web page where they start you with the fundamentals. It's a great resource when you are getting started. They do also have a getting started resource that I think is in that set of fundamentals. Really, really, really helpful. Uh, we have colleagues in Utah State University. Uh, the group is called WebAIM, Web Accessibility in Mind. But if you just talk about WebAIM, people will know it. And then you can also come into the AbleTech Accessibility site. Um, you can get to us just through our regular website. We have a growing body of resources. We're actually doing a lot of revamping of our content over the next few months uh, to, to provide more resources that help people to apply accessibility to their specific role, to their job, to their civic life, whatever it might be. So there are plenty of places to go to read more about it. Let me grab these links and um, see if I can drop them into the, I'm gonna stop my, stop my share. And I do welcome questions, comments, if you want, uh, I've seen a few, questions and comments in the chat. Uh, we have a couple of minutes left. So I, I certainly welcome any questions that you all might have um, while we have a little bit of time left. And I will narrate this link that I just dropped in. This first one is the World Wide Web Consortium that I mentioned before. This next one is to WebAIM, our, our colleagues out in uh, Utah. And then this last link is to us at Oklahoma Able Tech. You can also just search uh, for web accessibility and find a ton of vendors first, more than likely, uh, but you can find a ton of information. These are reliable sources, so these are great places to start. Hillary, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Uh, I, I appreciate all of you uh, hanging with me for lunch. I know it's your lunch hour. Uh, very much appreciate it. Uh, again, I've got a session on accessibility in Word uh, at the, not this next block, but the next one. And so if you want to learn a little bit more about some of the how-tos, we're not going to get everything, but we'll get a good start and, and get more into some of the concepts and how you put those into action using a tool that is usually pretty familiar to folks. So uh, thank you, Mike, again, to you and your crew. Thank you so much for having me. Really appreciate it. Yeah, Rob, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Everyone, check in with Rob at the two o'clock session. His session is eight ways to create more accessible Word and PDF documents. So that'll happen during the two o'clock session. Uh, if there's any other questions as we have a couple minutes, I'm sure that Rob will answer or do his best. If not, check in with Rob at two o'clock and chat with him then in the smaller session. Excellent. All right, thanks again. Guys, thank you so much. We'll um, wrap up this keynote. You have 15 minutes of your life you can go do something with, um, but then join us back again at one o'clock and we will move on to the next group of sessions. So again, thanks Rob. Thanks everybody for being here. Thanks everybody. <laughs>